Okay, hello and welcome to the Creative Academy, your go-to source for accountability, coaching, and community for writers. I am Eileen Cook and I'm here today to talk a little bit about role-playing games and world building. And I have with me Jared Hunt. Welcome, Jared. Hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so to start off, I'm wondering, like I am someone who came to this world a little bit late, whereas I think you grew up in it possibly since birth. Um, <laughs> Can you explain what an RPG or a role-playing game is? I can give it a shot. Uh, there's a lot of very smart people out there who are uh, trying to figure out uh, a good answer <laughs> for this particular question. Um, some of the, the ones that uh, go back a ways, uh, if you, uh, particularly little boys, but whoever uh, might have been playing a game like uh, Cops and Robbers. And at least in my experience as a kid, uh, with cops and robbers, there was very often the bang, bang, I shot you, no, you didn't. Uh, <laughs> and the ensuing uh, real fights that, <laughs> that sometimes happen. So um, in a, a very simple way to define it, uh, a role-playing game uh, is a way of uh, putting rules onto those uh, those types of situations. So uh, it's still a, a shared storytelling experience, uh, like you know the, the, the cop chasing the robber. Um, uh, but when it comes time to say, shoot uh, one at the other, then a role-playing game typically has some kind of rule set where you would decide did I hit you or not? Uh, did the robber drive fast enough to escape? Uh, so on and so forth. So that's, um, that's a really simple uh, example, uh, but I think it, it does convey the, uh, the heart of a role-playing game in that it's, um, it's telling stories that exist in a uh, shared imagination. So it comes, get some really interesting situations when you have all of these different people who are theoretically experiencing the same thing, but in fact are not. And then you have a set of rules to get uh, at least a few points of agreement <laughs> on, uh, on where we are, what's going on. Yeah. So role-playing games were basically a way to stop punching each other in the playground. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. Hopefully, but yeah. not a hundred percent. <laughs> that has been my experience. Uh, no punches thrown in any uh, any games that I've ever participated in, so must be working. <laughs> there you go. So first off, like my first experience with any kind of role playing game actually didn't start until university, uh, when I was going out with someone who was interested in role playing games, and they at the time were playing Dungeons and Dragons, which I think is probably the most well known RPG. Oh, by far. In yeah. fact, it's to the point that most people use the word interchangeably. Uh, it, so Dungeons and Dragons is the Kleenex <laughs> <laughs> of role playing games. Um, yeah, yeah that's, uh, I think Dungeons and Dragons probably sells uh, five to 10 times as much as all other game role playing games combined. And apparently your soul does not belong to Satan, which is what we had learned in Catholic school about Dungeons and Dragons. So I'm glad to know that's not true. Um, but I think what surprised me when I started again, sort of knowing people who play Dungeons and Dragons is it's not just fantasy world. So I remember I, the first game I actually participated in was a 1920s kind of heist story. Mm -hmm. um, so is there any limitation to the, like the kind of worlds that people are playing? No, there is a, uh, if you can imagine it, someone has probably designed and is running a game in that scenario. Um, it's an amazing, uh, to the same degree as if you can imagine it, somebody wrote a novel, uh, somebody is working on a movie or a script at least, uh, the, the, the possibilities are, are endless. All right. So you've done game design. So what kind of things do you consider when you're trying to create a world that's kind of feel real because as a game designer are you then in charge of sort of setting up the parameters of that world or that is definitely the traditional uh role uh what we call the the game master or dungeon master if you're specifically in dungeons and dragons though uh, i think that's like 
trademarked or protected in some way. So <laughs> 50 shades of gray. Okay, master. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, as the, the uh, designer um, in a traditional role-playing game like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you would be the dungeon master and the designer of the world. Uh, so you are in charge of uh, essentially everything other than the characters. So each player in a traditional role-playing game uh, has just the one character that that's the role that they're taking on in this setting and then the dungeon master uh, is in charge of every everyone else so every other uh, character uh, in fact the traditional term for it is a non-player character uh -huh. which is everybody who is not one of the characters that so that's part of the world building and then uh, describing every setting, whether it's uh, it's a dungeon uh, with a dragon in it, <laughs> uh, in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, or you know, to use the same setting, maybe you're going back to the village to sell all your loot that you just got. Uh, then the the various people who live in that town uh, would be up to the the dungeon master as well. Um, so that's the traditional way. There are uh, I, I think it falls on a, a spectrum and that there are also games where there may even be no game master at all and everyone shares the, the responsibility for creation. There are some games, uh, there's a, a local designer, Avery Alder, who uh, wrote a brilliant game, a post-apocalyptic queer game, where uh, each of the players is responsible for an aspect of the world. So it might be yeah. the weather. Um, I mean, I, I'm really grossly simplifying, yeah. but, um, and then that person is in charge of the, the town over there and uh, yeah, uh, okay. starvation uh, and, and other um, obstacles. That might be one person's responsibility. So that is much less common because uh, D and D, Dungeons and Dragons, is the, the biggest by far. Most people who think of role playing games think of the design coming from that one person, from the, the dungeon master. So, if you're following that model, then to make a very long answer to this question, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it would be up to me, for example. <laughs> um, and how much work do you have to do ahead of time? Like, is this something where you're spending a couple? you know, hours or weeks or like how long does it come up, take to come up with like a whole world for everybody else? Uh, well, that, that has, um, yeah, it could be any amount of time that you want to spend. Uh, there's a few different ways to approach it. Uh, one of the more common products that you can buy related to role-playing games are uh, settings. Uh, fantasy worlds that have been created by somebody else and you get the book um, that lists the locations and the characters and, and the history of, of all these different places and you use that in you know as an encyclopedia uh, that you can consult during the game in which case it's a good idea to read through that before the game starts yeah. it makes things go a little more smoothly uh, but you don't necessarily have to if you you're very quick at looking things up <laughs> on the fly. You could do, do it that way. Um, if you are designing your own world, so you're not using um, someone else's, then I think uh, there are, again, spectrum, but there are two main ways of looking at world building. Uh, there's the top down, which people would often associate with, say like Middle Earth from the Lord of the Rings. Yeah, okay. um, and, and I think that that's a more common and more applicable to writers as opposed to game designers. But in a top-down sense, what you're doing is you may even go back all the way and, and come up with the creation myth where the, yeah. the, say the gods of your fantasy world you know, created light and dark and, and brought it up from there. And so you, that's the very, that's about as high level as you yeah. can get, right? I'm not sure you can go much more than that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then you, then you uh, 
keep, you know, you come up with the countries and uh, all of the, the political figures who might be involved in, in the conflict at very high level. And you keep zooming in uh, until you're all the way down, which is the specific place that the characters are right now. So, so do people use like, uh, for example, and thanks to you, I am now uh, watching Game of Thrones just about you know, 10 years later than everybody else. But <laughs> is it something where someone says, okay, I love that world. And so I'm going to create a game that takes place within that world. And we're just going to create characters from that. Oh, I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands of games right now uh, set in, in Game of Thrones. Yeah. There is an officially licensed game. Of course, of there's an officially licensed one. <laughs> Role-playing game. So you can go out and, and buy that and it will have a lot of the setting material. Uh, I assume, you know, pr probably at least in some, at some degree of remove uh, taken right from George's notes. <laughs> um, and that's uh, another good example of, of the top down that you really get the sense in Game of Thrones that George Martin knew everything about that world before he got started. Uh, that may not literally be true, but that's certainly the way it feels. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's the advantage I see in the top down is there's this feeling of authenticity and completeness. Because I think one of the keys to making the world work in a role playing game is consistency. Uh, that creates the, the plausibility, the believability of the world. However, that is an enormous amount of work. Yeah. Right. Uh, and when you're typically doing this for fun, for a couple of <laughs> friends, uh, there's even very successful game designers are typically not making uh, a living at it. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that is mostly a hobby. So do you want to put hundreds uh, or maybe even thousands of hours yeah. over, over years into doing something uh, when you can only ever touch on a fraction, the actual story interacts with your notes on a just, just very, very tiny little plane. So is that worth it? For some people, yes, because the act of creation of the world is, the, is part of the fun. Uh, and that's great, go for it. Uh, but the other side, and, and uh, as I've you know, gotten older and less free time, <laughs> um, and maybe just my, my comfort level with games, I tend to go to almost the other end of the spectrum, which is um, bottom up. Okay. And in that kind of game design or world design, not so much the, the game mechanics, but the world, um, you prep exactly what you expect the characters to interact with in the next session. And that's it. So some of so, that <laughs> takes some educated guesses because you oh, don't yeah. actually know for sure. Uh, but the point is you don't come up with the king's name until you need a king. Yeah. Uh, you don't come up with the village next door, the next village over until you need that. Um, so that has the danger if, you, if your notes aren't good and if you don't uh, consult them frequently, the consistency becomes a serious issue. Um, again, it's typically you're doing this for fun, for a group of friends, they'll forgive you, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> uh, but the, the big advantage, of course, being there's minimal time investment. Um, you can even take that in a way, I was referring to Avery's game, in that no one knows anything about the world until the moment it's revealed in the session, which is a really fun. Uh, it's, it's challenging, particularly if you have, um, that your background is in a more traditional role-playing game where as the game master, you know everything and your word is law. Sometimes it's fun to just let go of that and, and turn, turn those questions over to the players. It's like, I don't know, what's the mayor like? Uh, or 
yeah, that, that, um, that blacksmith guy, what do you know about him? Tell me about him and his family. Or, you, you can um, have a lot of fun with that as well. The shared, shared, story, or shared world creation. Reminds me, there's a thing going around on Facebook where this dad posts that he was teaching his young daughters RPG. And so he had it set up where they were going to be surrounded by this circle of um, wolves, this wolf pack that was going to come along. And he had all these scenarios planned out for how they would fight the wolves and all this kind of stuff. And they became friends with the wolves and started their own wolf army. Yeah. <laughs> and like his tagline is, girls, man, they're going to take over the world. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, what example. do you do when, you know, you've sort of created something, whether that's you've put in, you know, a ton of hours or whether or not that's, you know, you're kind of working on the fly and people take the game in a way that you just hadn't expected. Like, how do you do that on the fly? For me, that's the whole point of, yeah. of this type of storytelling uh, is, yeah, the in a traditional um, storytelling, whether it's writing or, or whatever, your job, particularly as a, as a writer, your job is to guide us through the protagonist's story. And so the choices that you make for your protagonist, that's the story. When you are designing and running a role-playing game, that's the thing you can't do. That's none of your business. Yeah. That's the players. They're the protagonists of the story and they have to be the ones driving the true decision-making. Uh, and so you need to let go. And that's where the surprise comes in for me, which is a lot of the joy of this type of storytelling again. Um, now that takes some doing uh, not everybody, not every game master wants that. Uh, it's, it takes some practice is really. Yeah. Uh, it strikes me that it would be a great thing for people who um, maybe haven't done it before, but are interested in sort of writing within these worlds that, you know, one of the things I talk about a lot with people is oftentimes the first thing that you think of is the first thing that everybody else thinks of. So it tends to be the cliche. So, you know, someone walks into a room and they see a dragon and what do they do? Well, they run at the dragon with a sword, right? Um, so, you know, when someone, when you kind of push yourself to say like, well, what else could they do? Or when you open it up to a group of people and you have someone who's like, I make the dragon tea or I <laughs> yeah. do a spell or something where suddenly you realize that, you know, having to respond on the fly might open up story opportunities that you hadn't even considered. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, that's, yeah, that's a big part of the fun. Uh, I definitely remember uh, not so long ago when I wouldn't have been so comfortable with that, where I could even have found some frustration in, in the, the other players at the table, not wanting to follow <laughs> along with my ideas. I like uh, that you said follow versus like doing the wrong thing. <laughs> that's a very involved word choice on your part. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I, I get, uh, and there are even some, some of those very smart people trying to figure out exactly what a role playing game is. Some of those people would defend to the death that, that uh, it's the responsibility of the game or dungeon master uh, uh, to control everything. And, and that's part of the, the immersion in the world. Uh, that's fine if that's the way you want to run it. Uh, yeah. But to me, that really misses the point um, of, of gaming. It's the, the improv takes time. It takes practice. It takes uh, building up that self-confidence of it doesn't matter what they, the players come up with. We'll just roll with it and it'll be different and it'll be fine in a, an unexpected way. <laughs> what I had in mind hopefully would have been fun. This will be fun too. Let's do that. <laughs> that takes a lot of, I think, mental flexibility. And I think what strikes me is it is probably that idea of practice. Like um, with anything, when I'm doing something the first time, because I'm anxious and weird, like I will plan stuff out to the ninth degree to try and be prepared for everything. 
um, which sometimes can suck all the joy out of an activity. So, you know, being comfortable and just being like, this is just going to work out, I think takes a little bit of a, a difference. For sure. And my recommendation for someone, well, I would actually recommend that you play a lot yeah. before you try running a game. That's not necessary. And there are lots of great stories and lots of great resources out there for people who have never done either who want to run for themselves. So I'm not saying don't do that, but typically you would play uh, first to, to build up your confidence. When you're making that move to, to being the one who's running the show, uh, a lot of your anxiety can be uh, at least mitigated by remembering where to put your planning energy. If you put your planning energy into trying to guess what the players will do and think, you can just go forever, right? <laughs> so that, that feels, it's not something you should totally ignore, but it feels very low leverage. And I don't focus on that very much at all. What I focus my planning time and energy on is knowing the world. So then if, if they go in a completely unexpected direction, at least I'm, I'm familiar with the setting enough that I can, can roll with it and feel confident. Are there like set resources that you go through? Like I know the Science Fiction Writers Association has a handout, um, like a PDF document on like world building. And it says things like, what are the politics? Um, how does magic work? Like, do you have a set of questions that you kind of mentally go through or for you is it just practice at this point you've just done it enough that you kind of think it through um are you a jedi master of world building jared <laughs> not whatsoever <laughs> um i think that really depends on on the game both in terms of the rules of that game and the setting and the players the group that you're, you're going with so I, I don't think that there's a a specific answer to give there uh, you'd have to adjust depending on yeah on where you're at do you think I know you've written as well do you think your experience with world building with games has impacted any of your writing I think so uh, I, I mean there's so much cross-pollination between them I don't know that I could even separate them yeah uh, yeah I think having experience in both um, completely informs the each, yeah the other because sure. it strikes me and again i haven't written a ton of fantasy but certainly worked with a lot of people who are writing fantasy that there's all these resources there's all these setting books like you're talking about there's all this stuff out there for games that that's a great place to start because not that you're going to copy it not that you're going to say like i like game of thrones so i'm going to i'm just going to create the world and call it something slightly different no. Um, that that's cheating. Um, you can do totally. anything for a game, but you can't really get away with it in a book, but it would give you a thing to be like, okay, well in game of Thrones, there are these, you know, different communities. There's the North, there's King's Landing, there's these different families with this crest, like, okay, I want to have something similar to that, but mine is going to be more, you know, X, Y, Z. It's going to take place in space versus, you know, this other world. Sure. Um, it would give you kind of a place to start, I think. It could be yeah. an interesting way to kind of play with that. I agree. I think one big caution I would extend, uh, and most, I think Tor.com has it, and, and most publishers and agents as well who accept sci-fi, fantasy, or spec fic in, in any way, uh, will have some variation on the warning please do not send me the story of your role-playing group. <laughs> because those are not, those stories are good by virtue of you having a stake and a presence in them that does not objectively make them good stories. And that's almost, uh, I've over the years have, have kept a uh, log of the events in each of the game sessions and some of these, we had so much fun and just rolling with laughter, uh, absolute blast. And I look back at the notes, like that is not in any way interesting to anyone else. <laughs> Those are, <laughs> that's a very unique to this type of storytelling and it's your immersion and shared experience. So yeah, I, I think, is, yeah, you're not as some... funny as you think you are. Jared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sadly, no. Um, 
So that is a, a caution I would extend is uh, world building in particular, there's a lot of crossover in, in the good habits uh, for world building for writing and for role playing. But in terms of actual storytelling, it's important to keep in mind that they are almost unrelated. And, and I haven't ever tried uh, mostly because most of the role playing games I've done have, have not sadly been um, amazingly like hysterically funny. They're usually sort of like I die really early. So <laughs> tragically for me. Um, but it, it does strike me that the difference is that kind of idea as you were talking about it being immersed or it being a shared experience. Whereas for the reader reading the book, they are usually kind of going through one character or a set number of characters, but they're in each of those characters' heads. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the gaming world, you're inside the character you're portraying, but you're not necessarily understanding where the other characters are coming from. Absolutely. Uh, and I think the other part of it is uh, in a role-playing game at, a, at the table or uh, increasingly in situations like this where, where the group is meeting online, uh, a big part of uh, what makes the story engaging and what makes you know, those, those moments of hysterical laughter, it's almost equal parts the story that you're telling and and the the meta story which is the people yeah. at the table or on the screen and what they're saying and the monty python references and <laughs> you know all of these um that that are outside of the actual story uh, of the game in that traditional sense so uh, yeah those are are so much so much a, a just a vital part of the fun of role playing games is the shared social experience uh, as much or more than than any story that happens along the way <laughs> so for someone who's interested in role-playing games who hasn't done it before how can they find a group or what's your suggestion like how do you get started uh, all, there's still quite a few uh, friend, friendly local gaming stores uh, uh, around if there's one in in your your neighborhood in your town, uh, that's a good place to to begin. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons is owned by a company called Wizards of the Coast, which is owned by Hasbro, uh -huh. which is an enormous company with very <laughs> deep pockets. And so there is very strong support for what they call community play. And so you uh, create a character according to the rules that they publish. And then you just show up uh, at the designated time and get matched up with random other people who are interested in that. And each store will have their own schedule. So you need to check in on that. So that's, that's a big one. If you are brand new and don't know anyone else who already does some role playing, uh, then that's, a, that's probably your best place to begin. Uh, there are more and more online resources uh, there's a, a site called Roll20, R-O-L-L-20, all one word, that hosts hundreds of, of games at any given time uh, using uh, all of the, yeah, just, again, hundreds of different systems uh, and settings, and, and you can log in, and, and many of them, not all, but many of them will, will have an option for new people to join, uh, whether you're, you're known or not, so... That's uh, if physical proximity and, and travel are issues, then the online space is getting better and better all the time. The tools and the communities are, are growing. Uh, otherwise, if you know other people who you already have a personal relationship with who want to try it as well, then many games, particularly things like Dungeons and Dragons and some of the other bigger names uh, will have starter sets and you can go and just grab it and, and they're not necessarily cheap, but it's not a huge investment, 50 bucks or something will get you a starter set and, and the basic rules, how to create characters, uh, an introductory story, and you can get everybody together and, and run through them. They, uh, yeah, they, that's a really, that would be my first choice for sure. Um, 
even better, I guess, is if you know somebody <laughs> who runs a game and, and it's your first time, then, then just ask. Uh, most people who are in the uh, you know, active participants in the hobby uh, want new people to get into it. So just ask. It's more fun to share stuff. It is. <laughs> All right. So thank you so much, Jared. I appreciate your time talking with us about role-playing games and getting people thinking a little bit about uh, how they might uh, take up another hobby that might uh, inform and help their writing. So thank you to Jared and thanks to everyone for watching the video. And we hope to see you around the Creative Academy. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me. Are you a member yet? Join us today and unlock a wealth of resources, masterclasses, feedback opportunities, and community events designed to help you reach the next step in your writing journey. No matter what stage you're at, we've got a helping hand to guide you along the way. Check out our free resource room if you'd like to get a taste of how we can help you reach your writing and publishing goals. Thanks for bringing us along on your writing and publishing journey. Donna, Crystal, and I hope we'll see you around the Creative Academy soon.